What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about hypernatremia. Before we get started, I want you guys to please take a second, hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe if you guys really do like this video, if it makes sense and if it helps you. It, it, doing those things helps us to really continue to make great content, free educational content for you guys' enjoyment, so please do those things. Also, I really urge you guys, I'm serious, check out the description, in the description box below, we have a link to our website. That'll take you there, and we have some awesome notes, some amazing illustrations, that I think will be truly crucial to kind of follow along with me during this lecture and truly getting a good understanding of the topic. So without further ado, let's get started on hypernatremia. So <clears throat> with hypernatremia, let's kind of have a basic definition. It's really not that complicated, right? So hypernatremia is whenever you look at the actual serum, so you draw blood, right? you're drawing blood, when you draw the blood, you, you can measure a bunch of different things from what's called your BMP. The BMP is really the standard test that can give you your basic metabolic panel. It tells you lots of electrolytes. One of those is sodium. So we're going to represent sodium here in pink. And in this disease of hypernatremia, the primary problem is that the patient's sodium level in the blood is just too dang high. Right? And so that begs the question, what's the normal serum sodium level? So if I were to take blood, what would be expected is the average serum sodium level, right? So a normal kind of serum sodium level is going to be anywhere from about 135 to 145 milli equivalents per liter. That's the normal serum sodium. So whenever a patient has high serum sodium, so whenever they have what's called hypernatremia, so they have elevated levels of sodium, the basic problem here is that their sodium is greater than the upper limit of normal. So we say that their sodium is greater than 145 milli equivalents per liter. That's the basic concept of hypernatremia. Now, really quick to kind of get you guys ready for the understanding of hypernatremia because we got to go over a lot of the, ca the causes, the pathophysiological processes, all of that stuff, and even the consequences of hypernatremia. When we talk about hypernatremia, there is really, when it comes down to it, two particular just pure thematic causes of hypernatremia. I'm serious. It's really not that complicated. The two primary causes of hypernatremia when it comes down to it is really you're either losing a lot of water from your bloodstream. Because when you think about it, sodium and water kind of have a very significant interplay. So whenever there is lots of water, technically you have a relative drop in the sodium. Whenever there's very little water, you have a relative increase in the sodium. So one very important cause to a patient developing hypernatremia is a significant water loss. And by far, that is gonna be the most common cause of hypernatremia. Now, the second one is if you're not losing tons of water, what if you're gaining tons of sodium? That's not as common, but it is something that you want to consider. So it could also be an increase in your sodium gain. With that being said, this is really the underarching kind of pathophysiology and the mechanism of hypernatremia. So hypernatremia, by definition, is a high serum sodium level. The sodium level in the blood is greater than 145 milliequivalents per liter. And the, honestly, the bare bones pathophysiology behind that is that the patient either has too much water. So when you think about that, there's too much water that's lost. And whenever the water is lost, there is a relative increase in the amount of sodium in the bloodstream or you're giving them too much sodium or they're absorbing more sodium. That's the basic thing. So that leads to the next question. Whenever patients become hypernatremic, which is something that's very interesting, is there a way that our body tries to come up with a normal way to maintain a degree of homeostasis? Since sodium and water balance are so intertwined, is there a normal compensation mechanism that my body exerts to bring my sodium down and bring my water up? Is there that? Let's talk about that compensation mechanism. All right, my friends, so we know that hypernatremia is a high serum sodium greater than 145, primarily due to lots of water loss or sodium gain. That's the basic pathophysiology. And we'll go into a little bit more in a second. But I really want you guys to take a, a very strong kind of second away from that before we start getting into causes and really understand the, the compensation mechanism of sodium and water imbalances, right? So how do we maintain homeostasis? Because if we think about it, the breakdown, the cause of hypernatremia comes from the breakdown of this compensation mechanism. So let's go through that. When a patient develops 
hypernatremia, so their sodium level within the blood is too high. You know what that does? It really increases the tonicity of the blood. And in other words, the osmolality of the blood is very high, right? So that's a very important terminology. It increases the osmolality. I'm going to represent that by O is OSM. It increases the osmolality of the blood. When you increase the osmolality of the blood, that is a very potent, very strong stimulator of what? ADH. Because what that tells me, what, when you have high osmolality, it tells me two things. One is that there's either too much sodium or there's very little water. So you either have too much sodium or you have very little water. Either way, both of these things increase the osmolality of the blood. You know there's special receptors around the hypothalamus? So look at this, there's this cute little receptor here, they're called osmoreceptors. And osmoreceptors respond to the osmolality of the blood. So when the osmolality of the blood is very high, guess what these sons of guns do? They stimulate the osmoreceptors. The osmoreceptors then stimulate the posterior pituitary to start pumping out something called ADH. And you're gonna pump out a lot of this ADH. What does ADH do? I don't want to make it too complicated. Two things, that's it, two things. One is it actually stimulates an increase in your thirst mechanism. So it increases your thirst. I really want to highlight that. That's very, very important. So one of these is it increases your thirst mechanism. So you drink more water. Hmm. If I drink more water, that means more water goes into my GIT, more water gets absorbed across my, my actual GIT, and more water comes into the bloodstream. And if I increase my amount of water, I may cause a relative decrease in the sodium. So that's the whole concept here, is that with this, what am I gonna do? I'm going to increase my water, which causes a relative, relative decrease and the serum sodium. Isn't that cool? And on top of that, if I increase my water and I cause a relative decrease in the serum sodium, what do I do to my plasma osmolality? I decrease the plasma osmolality. So that's a really cool concept there. It kind of shows you that loop process. The second mechanism of ADH is it goes and works particularly on the kidneys. And it binds on to this little receptor here called a V2 receptor. You know another name for ADH is vasopressin? And so it binds onto this vasopressin 2 receptor and the collecting duct. And it plugs in these little pores, these little holes into the actual collecting duct cells. They're called aquaporins. And then water that's actually moving through the collecting duct will be like, mm -mm, I'm gonna run through here. And it reabsorbs tons of water across that collecting duct. And then look, if I get lots of water that gets reabsorbed across the collecting duct, my friends, oh, where do you think that water gonna go? That water is gonna go nicely into the blood. And if it goes into the bloodstream, because I'm reabsorbing and I'm moving it into the bloodstream, right? That's gonna do what? It's gonna increase the amount of water that's present in the bloodstream, and that's gonna cause a relative decrease in the serum sodium. That's gonna decrease the plasma osmolality, and that's going to fix the high sodium. That was the problem. So isn't that cool? So the two mechanisms here, one is it actually helps with the reabsorption of water, my friends. So it's going to increase what's called water reabsorption. And then the first thing is it increases thirst. You know what the primary problem is, what we said with hypernatremia, is the patient is losing water or they're gaining sodium. The most common cause we said is water loss, right? Well, you know where the breakdown comes? Really, here's where the pathology actually comes. So the pathology here, my friends, with this actual process here, is that the patients, what? Aren't able to, you know, when you're thirsty, what do you do? You drink water. What if you have a patient who can't drink water? For whatever reason, I'm being serious, what if the problem here is that the patient doesn't have the ability to access water, or they don't know how to drink water, which may sound dumb when I say that, but I'm just being serious. What are the particular problems here? Because if the problem is, in this situation where there is decreased access to water, then I won't be able to drink water, increase my water, reabsorb the water into, or absorb water across the GIT into the bloodstream, and then cause the relative decrease in the sodium. I won't be able to do that. So that's the problem here. And so this is patients that I want you to remember. These are patients who have an altered mental status. 
These are patients that have some degree of maybe dementia, so they're like super elderly. These are neonates who don't have the ability to go and drink water because they barely have any functional kind of like components of their limbs, right? This is patients who are intubated, right? Very, very common in the intubated patient. So this is the things that I want you to be able to think about for these patients who, again, don't have access to water. If they don't have access to water, they can't have this thirst mechanism. And so because of that, guess what? This whole process right here is inhibited and they don't have the ability to absorb the water. This is one of the big things. Most patients, what's really, really key here is most patients who most people fix their high sodium. When you have high sodium, what does it do? It increases your thirst mechanism. But if you're one of these patient populations, you might not be able to fix that thirst mechanism because you may not have access to the free water. That is the big concept that I want you guys to get a hold of. The second thing is water reabsorption or ADH really, if you will. What if there's a problem where ADH isn't being produced or the kidneys aren't responding to the ADH? So then there's another concept to this pathology, which is what if you actually have, again, with this big kind of overarching concept here, is that when you think about this kind of pathological process here, the problem that can kind of arise is what if the problem has inability to produce ADH? So in other words, there is a decrease in ADH or no response no response to the ADH. That's a problematic issue because guess what? You're not going to be able to reabsorb water across the actual kidney tubules. If you can't reabsorb water across the kidney tubules, can you increase the water reabsorption? No. And so if I can't increase the water reabsorption, am I gonna be able to drop my sodium relatively? No. Am I gonna be able to fix my hypernatremia? No. Am I gonna worsen that process? And so that's a really, really important concept. So whenever you have this particular problem, this can lead to this particular issue. And that really comes down to why I want you guys to understand the compensation mechanisms. So now that we've gone through the definition of hypernatremia, high serum sodium greater than 145 caused by lots of water loss or lots of sodium gain, mechanisms by which patients compensate is when they have a high sodium causes ADH release because we think if there's a high sodium, there's an increased plasma osmolality. ADH reabsorbs water across the kidneys and increases the thirst mechanisms to drink more water, absorbs more water across the GIT, more water into the bloodstream, causes a relative decrease in the sodium, fixing the hypernatremia. If a patient can't access free water for whatever reason because they're intubated, they're altered, they're elderly, they're demented, they're neonates, then these patients won't fix their hypernatremia. And if a patient has a problem with their ADH not being produced or not actually being able to respond to the ADH, then again, that patient will develop a hypernatremia because they can't reabsorb water across the kidneys. And if they can't reabsorb water across the kidneys, what then happens? Then they're gonna dump a lot of the water into the urine. And again, they're not gonna be able to increase the water in their bloodstream, cause a relative decrease in the sodium and fix their hypernatremia. That's the basic theme. So there is more to add on to this, but this is a really important core concept. So what I want to do now is I really want to dig into the causes a little bit more because we've kind of inched into it. So what I want to do now is I want to go over what are the reasons by which a patient will actually lose tons of water and what are the potential causes of that. And then we'll also talk about the, 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 the actual last one, which is what is the maybe interesting cause by which a patient increases their sodium gain? So that's the next thing I wanna dive into is how exactly does a patient develop water losses or sodium gain? Let's talk about that. All right, my friends, so hypernatremia, water loss, sodium gain. That's really the underlying theme behind this, right? So what would be the reasons why we would lose water? I just want you to think about it like this. Either you're losing water from the kidneys or you're not. <laughs> like that's it. So if we're talking about water loss, you're either losing water from the kidneys or you're not losing it from the kidneys. So it's from some other source. That's the way I want you to look at this. And then we'll quickly talk about if you increase the sodium gain, what are the causes behind that? So three primary causes of hypernatremia. When you really break it down, we said that in the beginning, hypernatremia is caused by a increase in the water loss or an increase in the sodium gain, right? If we take and just dive into that a little bit more, the real reason is because you're losing water from either your kidneys or you're losing water from another source or you're gaining so much sodium. Now, when you lose that water, right, naturally you become hypernatremic, 
because you cause a relative kind of like, again, increase in the sodium when you drop your water, your body should compensate, right? It should start producing ADH. And ADH should then do what? It should reabsorb water across the kidneys or it should increase your thirst mechanisms and cause you to reabsorb water. What if you don't even produce ADH? You think about that? What about a disease where I have some type of hypothalamic problem or pituitary problem and I don't produce something called antidiuretic hormone? So that's the problem. The problem is I don't produce this son of a gun. What would that disease be called if I don't produce ADH? Then it's something called central, central diabetes insipidus. We call that DI. And really the disease process here is that you have some type of like hypothalamic pituitary lesion of some sort, right? So there's damage to the hypothalamus, damage to the pituitary gland, or you've gone into what's called brain herniation. So the person is herniated. Those are really the two most common reasons is some type of hypothalamic pituitary lesions disease process because they're the ones responsible, right? So you have hypothalamic neurons that move down to the actual posterior pituitary and release ADH. If you damage them in the hypothalamus or damage them in the posterior pituitary, it's not out of this world to think that that's the cause of the low ADH. Or if a patient herniates, then they herniate, they smush their brain. They actually lose complete cerebral function. So that could be another one is brain herniation. This is actually a very, very common cause in patients who have very large kind of uh, brain herniation syndromes. So that's one particular reason, right? So one of these that I want you to remember here for the renal water loss is central DI. Now here's the next question. What if it's not due to low ADH? What if, your, what if your actual brain produces ADH? But here, let's actually keep going off of this. Your body actually, let's continue off of this concept here. So naturally what should happen is ADH should go down here and act on what? This thing called the V2 receptor. And the natural mechanism here is it creates these things called aquaporin subunits and should naturally pull water across where? It should pull water across these kidney tubules, right? That's the general concept is that it should pull water across the actual kidney tubules. And the overarching theme behind this is, is this water will get into the actual bloodstream. And if the water gets into the bloodstream, what should that do? it should theoretically drop the patient's sodium, right? It should drop the patient's sodium because now we're gonna have an increase in the amount of water so we'll cause a relative decrease in the sodium, right? That's the whole concept is we'll increase this amount of water inside of the bloodstream. But if you don't have the ability to produce ADH because of this disease, are you gonna do this? No, you're not gonna be able to reabsorb water across the actual kidney tubules and input the water into that of the bloodstream. And so in this process, you don't allow for this to occur. So water reabsorption does not occur. And you still have this decrease in water within the bloodstream. And that is the problem here. And so where does all that dang water go? Well, if you're not reabsorbing it across the kidneys, guess what, my friends? If you can't reabsorb it across the kidneys, tons and tons and tons of that water just dump into the urine and you end up with massive, massive amounts of what's called polyuria. You produce tons of urine that's rich in water. And that's the problem with this. Now, that's one reason is central DI, right? So you don't produce ADH. What if your kidneys have not res no response to the ADH? So you produce ADH, let's say that you have the other scenario here, where ADH is being produced, but the kidney tubules aren't responding to it. That's a different kind of disease, right? So the second one is a very interesting type of concept here. So the second one is called, what's called nephrogenic DI. And this one is where ADH is actually being present. So now let's actually do a different part of this diagram. Here's another receptor. Let's say that there's no problem with the hypothalamus or the posterior pituitary. There's no herniation. ADH in this situation is in normal amounts and it binds onto the receptor. But in this particular scenario, the receptor doesn't respond to it. So in this situation, it's not the presence of ADH that's the problem, it's the response to ADH. And so then you inhibit this particular response. Same kind of concept, you don't reabsorb water across the kidney tubules, and if you don't reabsorb water across the kidney tubules, then you don't have as much water inside of the bloodstream, and so there's a decrease in your water, because where's all that water going? 
it's going into the urine. So you have polyuria. And again, if that's the case, if you lose tons and tons and tons of water, then you develop a relative increase in the actual serum sodium. And that's where hypernatremia kind of exists. Now, what in the heck can cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? I don't want to cause a, I don't want to write a ton of things down, but I want you to understand that lithium is going to be the most common cause and the one you'll likely see on your exam. Another one is hypercalcemia. Don't forget that one. And um, another one that's really important is when a patient is recovering from an acute tubular necrosis. So it's what's called status post acute tubular necrosis. So they're recovering from that. That's the big particular reasons by which a patient can develop nephrogenic diabetes and symptoms. These are the big ones that I want you to remember. There's many other causes, but please, for the love of goodness, don't forget lithium. That's the concept with this particular aspect of renal water loss. So again, you're losing water into the urine because ADH is either not present, that's one problem, or your kidneys aren't responding to the ADH. If it's not present, central DI. If they're not responding to the ADH, nephrogenic DI. Boom, shakalaka, let's move on to the next aspect. The next aspect here is, it has nothing to do with ADH. It's due to drugs or other molecules. So, you know what happens? You know there's a couple different concepts here. So let's say that we talk about this in the sense of diuretics. This is the next one. This is a big one, my friends, diuretics. Diuretics would be the third cause behind someone developing this hypernatremia due to renal water loss. There's many different types of diuretics. One is we can kind of define them as, one is called osmotic diuretics. And there's so many of these. One is called mannitol, one is called urea, and another one is called hyperglycemia. When a patient has any of these molecules that get into the bloodstream, what happens is these molecules filter across the actual glomeruli. And here's these molecules in the kidney tubules now. Guess what they do? They suck water into the kidney tubules. And so if you suck water into the kidney tubules, guess what's gonna happen? All that water now is going to get lost where? All that water is going to get lost into the urine. And this causes pretty decent amounts of polyuria, right? So this is gonna be another really, really big one here where it's gonna cause a decent amount of water to be lost into the urine. So this is gonna be called, this is polyuria. So polyuria, and again, it's gonna have massive amounts of water because there's some type of molecule which has an osmotic pull to it, which kind of yanks water into these kidney tubules and out of cells and causes it to get lost into the actual urine. That's one particular etiology. The second one is if it's not a loop diuretic, it's what's called a loop diuretic. So a loop diuretic. This is something like furosemide. You know what these do? These sons of guns, they inhibit the loop diuretic inhibits what's called the sodium potassium 2 chloride cotransporter. This son of a gun right here, you inhibit it. If you inhibit that son of a gun right there, guess what you can't do? You can't push sodium and chloride into the medullary interstitium. You know what this thing does? It creates a gradient. It creates a gradient in the medulla of the kidneys that helps to be able to pull water or reabsorb water. So it helps with the movement of water. So imagine here, it's like this, basic kind of concept here. If I were to do another separate diagram here, is let's say here's the descending part, here's the ascending part, right? And this ascending part, you pump out lots of what's called sodium. I'm gonna represent that sodium and chloride, all these like black dots here. So this is the ascending limb, this is the descending limb. So this part here, this part here, I'm just zooming in on it, right? What happens is when you have all these sodium chloride molecules out here, which is because of that transporter, the sodium potassium 2 chloride cotransporter, it yanks water out, right? And so that means that there's less water that's present in the tubules. If you pull water out into this area, now there's more water molecules out here because of all this sodium and chloride here, then less water is in the tubules. And that means you'll have less water that actually goes into your urine. Well, what if I inhibit that transporter and now, I don't put any of that sodium and chloride out here. So there's very, very little of that sodium and chloride out here in the medullary interstitium. And I, am I gonna yank water out into that space? No. Guess where the water stays, my friends? In the kidney tubules. Runs through the kidney tubules and ends up into the urine. 
and they have polyuria. That is the primary pathology with a renal water loss. So when it comes down to it, I want you to remember when a patient is losing water that causes their hypernatremia, it's renal water loss, extra renal water loss, or sodium gain. If it's renal water loss, it's three causes. One, central DI. Second, nephrogenic DI. Third, diuretics, osmotic and loops. Those are the causes. Big thing to think about here is when you look at this, this polyuria effect, Lots and lots and lots and lots of water. We're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but I wanna kinda of put this into your brain now. When you have lots of water, what do you think that does to the osmolality that's present in that urine? If it has lots and lots and lots of water. If you have osmolality, osmolality, so again, if there's less water, it makes it a little bit more tonic, a little bit more hypertonic, right? So then the osmolality would go up. If there's more water, it would decrease the tonicity and that would actually cause the osmolality to go down. So in these diseases, the osmolality is very low. The urine osmolality, which is very, very important. We'll get to that a little bit later. All right, my friends, that covers renal water loss. Now let's cover sources of water loss that are not from the kidney. All right, my friends, so the next thing is extra renal water loss. All right, so you're not losing water from the kidney, you're losing water from some other source. It's really pretty simple. Thank goodness, all right? So either you're, you're vomiting it or you got like a punami going on here. So you're, you know, you're, you're peeing out your butthole or you're just vomiting like it's going out of style. So it's either coming up this end or it's coming out this end, right? And, and that's your water loss source. It's very straightforward, right? There's no complicated mechanism behind that, thank goodness. But you're losing water from these particular sources, whether it be from, if it's coming out of this end, what would this be considered to be? I mean, it's not out of this world to think about it, diarrhea. And this one, vomiting or NG tube suction, right? So if you're losing water from the upper end or from the bottom end, this could be due to things like vomiting, or it could even be due to like excessive NG tube suctioning or aspiration, right? So this would be, again, this is your GI losses which is very, very common, especially the diarrhea aspect. So one reason for extra renal water loss is GI losses. One is it's coming up from the mouth hole, so vomiting or excessive NG tube suctioning. The second one is it's due to excessive diarrhea. But usually this diarrhea is a very specific, it's, it's an osmotic diarrhea, right? So if you're using things like laxatives or if a patient <laughs> develops cholera, you know, those are the kind of things, but usually this is like laxatives. This is a big one, especially something called lactulose. They use that a lot in patients with hepatic encephalopathy. Very, very common, but this is the thing. So you're yanking water. So what happens is these things, generally you're losing water, you're pulling water out of the GIT and so it's not getting absorbed across the GIT, right? So you're not allowing for water to be reabsorbed across the GIT because you're either vomiting it or pooping it out. So you're not allowing for that water to be able to come into the actual bloodstream. And so because of that, this is your water loss source, right? And so if you lose water, right, there's a water loss, then there is a relative increase in the amount of sodium due to the water loss. What would your body do to compensate for this? What would it do? It would tell you to drink water, right? So your ADH mechanism would go off, it'll tell you to drink water, or try to reabsorb water across your kidneys, right? And so that'll be the mechanism. But what if you have limited access to water? Are you gonna be able to replace it? Or what, are, what if the losses are more than you're able to replace? That is where the problem comes in this disease. And so really what happens, the overarching theme here is that the loss becomes greater than the replacement of water. So the loss of water is becoming more than you can replace or you have limited access or inability to access the free water, such as you're intubated, you're altered, you're geriatric, you're a neonate, those types of effects. That's huge. Okay, that's again going back to that compensation mechanism that I talked about. The next one is called insensible losses. So the second cause here is called insensible losses. What the heck does that even mean, man? Don't worry, Big Daddy got gotcha. you. So insensible loss is the second cause is something that you can't quantify. You can't actually put a number to it. I could give you an idea if a patient poops into a bucket how much <laughs> poop they lost, right? I know that sounds terrible, but I could measure the volume that they lost there. If they vomit into an actual thing, I can measure that out. When it comes to sweating, when it comes to burns, when it comes to breathing and water losses from things that I actually can't quantify or calculate, that's called insensible losses. And there's two primary ways that I want you to remember it. 
believe it or not, breathing, you have water loss from the respiratory tract. And so whenever a patient is having a very fast respiratory rate, that's one particular cause, or a second one is mechanical ventilation. So patients who are on mechanical ventilation, this is a huge, huge trigger. They breathe a lots of water out. So they have excessive amounts of water loss from their respiratory tree. And if they have excessive amounts of water loss, then are they gonna be able to retain that water with inside of their bloodstream? No, they're losing tons of water from their bloodstream. So there's a, de a de deficit, if you will, of water. There's their water loss. If there's the water loss, there is the relative increase in sodium. Sodium goes up, right? And then you end up with hypernatremia. How do you fix it? You cause the patient to drink more water. If they can't, or they can't, if either they can't replace it quickly, or they're intubated, so they, can't have, they don't have access to free water, they will develop hypernatremia. You get the point there? That's cool, right? The second one here, so this would be one mechanism to the insensible losses. So one, is the patient is losing it from their respiratory tract. The second one is they're losing it from their skin. And so if they're losing it from their skin, they're losing tons and tons of water off of their skin surface. One way is because you're sweating a boatload, right? So this could be due to massive, massive sweating. Or when patients have extreme fevers, very high fevers will cause this as well. And one more, burns. Most of the body, like I've, I, this is really common. So very severe burns because these cells contain lots of water and you also have the inability to regulate water balance now. And so this will cause massive water losses and that will bump the sodium up. If you can't replace it fast enough or you have an inability to access free water, will you be able to fix that? Because you're gonna be thirsty. All of these situations, what are they gonna do? When you have this extra renal water loss, it is going to stimulate an increase in ADH. That's going to increase thirst, and that's going to increase water reabsorption. Right, so the kidneys will start trying to reabsorb water, but your thirst mechanism is going to go up. If you can't drink enough to replace the losses, or you have inability to access the free water, these patients will not fix their problem and they'll end up with hypernatremia. I pray that makes sense. The second, uh, concept here was the extra renal water loss, right? So we know we're losing water, whether it be renal or extra renal. Renal, central DI, nephrogenic DI, diuretics. Extra renal water loss is GI losses, vomiting, punami down there, right? And then the other one is insensible. It's breathing too fast, mechanically ventilated, intubated patients, they lose lots of water in that source, or from their skin, fevers, excessive sweating, or burn patients. The last one is sodium gain. When a patient gains too much sodium, that the sodium in their blood literally overcomes the amount of water that they have, that's their primary problem. It's not due to a water problem, it's due to a sodium problem. They're not losing excessive amounts of water. In fact, these patients tend to be more on the hypervolemic side. These patients tend to be on the hypovolemic to mildly euvolemic side. All right, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but in this situation, you gotta think about sodium. It's very easy. You either lose water or you gain sodium. What if I just give the patient a boatload of sodium? So I wanna cover this one first and we'll come back to this one. So this is gonna be the second etiology. So the second etiology here is you give them sodium, you dirty dog, you. So this would usually be due to, you're giving them, it's iatrogenic. It's iatrogenic. So here is infusions that contain lots and lots of sodium. And this is usually pretty common. So what are some of these high sodium solutions that you usually give to a patient IV? You would think, oh, if I'm eating like, you know, literally just pouring salt down my gullet, that would be a cause. That could be, that's usually like accidental, like in, you know, children, that is a possibility, salt poisoning. But more likely than that is going to be situations like if a patient is getting 0.9% sodium chloride, that contains a lot of sodium, right? Or if they're getting hypertonic saline solutions. So this is like 3%, 23.4%. That's really concentrated sodium. Or if they're getting another one called sodium bicarbonate. This is given a lot during like coding patients. You're giving them lots and lots of sodium bicarbonate. Their sodium shoots up after the code. These are very, very common. 
So in this situation, what's happening is you're running and you're giving the patient sodium via these IVs, pushing it directly into their bloodstream. And look, the sodium shoots through the roof. The water balance could actually be relatively normal for these patients to sometimes even a little bit elevated. But there's just so much more sodium because we're just shoving sodium into their veins and there may be normal to slightly increased amounts of water. But there is just so much sodium to the point where there's a relative hypernatremia, more sodium in comparison to the water. And it's due to us giving the patient that problem. This is the first one for the sodium gain that I wanted to talk about a little bit later, because this is the interesting one that they love to sometimes think about here. And this is when a patient has excessive amounts of aldosterone or mineral corticoids. So increased amounts of mineral, mineral, cord, I gotta spell that better, mineral corticoids. So you know the, um, the adrenal cortex, right? Mineral corticoids. This is basically uh, aldosterone, if you will. You know, if the, the actual adrenal cortex, it makes something called aldosterone. Now, to a minor degree, cortisol can be a little bit, have a little bit of a mineral corticoid effect. Very minor, but usually it's massive amounts of aldosterone. When aldosterone works, it goes to the distal convoluted tubule and does two things. One is it increases the sodium reabsorption. So in other words, it stimulates these distal convoluted tubular cells to increase the amount of sodium reabsorbed into the bloodstream. And then it stimulates it to excrete potassium into the urine. So the urine will be rich in potassium and the blood will be rich in sodium because it's going to reabsorb sodium like a banshee. Right? So that's the process in this disease. When a patient produces too much mineral corticoids, especially aldosterone, they reabsorb tons of sodium into their bloodstream and then waste potassium. If you get lots and lots and lots of sodium relative to the amount of water, what's gonna happen? Well then in this pathology here, my friends, you get, uh, actually this should be blue, in this pathology here, my friends, you're gonna have lots of sodium being reabsorbed. Water may be relatively normal, to maybe a little bit increase, but in this problem, there is a massive amount of sodium that's reabsorbed. There's your hypernatremia, right? So it's usually due to what's called hyperaldosteronism or excessive amounts of mineral corticoids. So usually there is some type of process here, which we call, you can give this kind of a, two kind of diseases here. One is called hyperaldosteronism. That's one. The second one could be to some degree Cushing syndrome. Because remember I told you that what's called cortisol, this one's due to high cortisol. Cortisol may have this ability to have the similar effect to hyperaldosteronism. So that's the big concept here. So with all of this being said, to recap, hypernatremia, high sodium, greater than 145. Problem is water loss or sodium gain. The way that our body compensates is producing ADH in response to the water losses. Right, because the plasma osmolality is going to be very high because we've lost the water. ADH reabsorbs water across the kidneys or absorbs water across the GIT by increasing your thirst mechanism. And patients who have inability to access free water, they won't drink water, so they won't correct their hypernatremia. Those are intubated, geriatrics, altered patients, neonates, intubated patients. The other concept here is that again, when a patient is going to develop hypernatremia, why did they develop it? Well, we said water loss. Well, there's two ways, renal, so central DI, nephrogenic DI, or diuretics, or extra renal, GI losses like vomiting, punamis, right? Or insensible losses, fevers, burns, sweating, or respiratory losses from excessive respiratory rates and breathing really fast or mechanical ventilation. And the last one is maybe it's not due to the water loss, maybe you just gained too much sodium, which was said not as common, but it can happen, and that's iatrogenic. You give them too much salt, and sodium chloride solutions, sodium bicarbonate, hypertonic saline solutions, or they have a disease where they reabsorb lots of sodium across their kidneys, such as in hyperaldosteronism or in Cushing syndrome. All right, my friends, we've covered that. Now the last thing is, is 
Why do I need to worry about hypernatremia? What is it gonna do to me? Let's talk about that. All right guys, so now we're gonna move on to why is hypernatremia bad? Is the patient just gonna spontaneously you know, combust and just blow up? No, 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 there's, there's a specific thing that happens, right? When a patient develops hypernatremia, I don't want you to get too carried away with this because oftentimes hypernatremia is kind of a lab finding. You may just see it when you get a BMP on a patient, but if the patient does develop severe consequences, it is important to understand what are the worst case scenario for hypernatremia. That's what I want you to focus on, not all these like random like you know facts to just memorize. No, when a patient develops acute increases in hypernatremia is where it's the problem, not necessarily chronic, because chronic patients have time to adapt. Right, so whenever it's acute rises in sodium, and I mean big rises in sodium, there is a big tonicity and fluid shifting kind of change, especially to the brain. Brain don't like that fluid shifts. What actually happens? It's very, very simple. Here's the patient now. This patient has what? Let's say a normal sodium, right? Normal sodium. It's a normal sodium and a normal amount of water. So the osmolality or the tonicity of this solution, let's just say it's kind of relatively normal in this particular scenario. What I do is I shift it over to this particular scenario. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to increase the serum sodium. All right? So for whatever reason, a patient develops hypernatremia because of renal water loss, extra renal water loss, or sodium gain. And we push their sodium up. So now their sodium goes through the roof. When the sodium goes through the roof in the blood now, what actually happens? Well, cells contain water in them, right? That's not out of this world to imagine, right? So there is water molecules that are present in cells. There's even sodium molecules in cells but sodium should mainly be in the extracellular fluid. It's the most common extracellular cation. If what happens is I take and I actually have a hypertonic uh, kind of like uh, extracellular fluid or plasma now, these cells feel the effect of it and they start yanking water out. And then the effect now is that these cells will shrink because what ends up happening is is it is going to yank tons of water molecules out of the cells into the bloodstream. And so the ultimate effect here is that you had a normal cell and now through this process of increasing the sodium in this issue here, what ends up happening? You cause the cells to shrink. And cells of the brain do not like to shrink. And so what happens is it loves to damage some of the actual neurons in the pons. And so when that happens, you develop something called osmotic demyelination syndrome. That's one potential complication. And so this is usually they present with like weakness and you know, speech difficulties and double vision and sometimes loss of consciousness, really, really nasty kind of situation. However, osmotic demyelination syndrome, really, really big point here, is you see this more commonly in patients who have hyponatremia that then caused a, that then had a over correction of sodium, right? To recap, that was what? Greater than eight milliequivalents per liter in a 24 hour period. That's more seen in that particular scenario. But the other situation here is whenever this, the actual brain tissue shrinks, so now imagine, this brain tissue starts shrinking. When it shrinks, it creates this kind of like shearing effect on the arteries and veins in the cerebrum. And then the result of this kind of shrinkage, <laughs> funny word, when it shrinks is it can create problems. The veins can rupture, the arteries can rupture. And this can produce things like intracranial hemorrhages. This can produce things like subarachnoid hemorrhages. And then the complication with this effect is you can develop focal neuro deficits, obviously, depending upon where it is. You can develop an altered mental status. It can cause seizures. So that's the ultimate thing. That's the worst case scenario. And it's usually acute rises in serum sodium to the point where it's like greater than 160. Usually, it's to the point where the sodium is increased to at least acutely greater than 160. That's the overarching theme. That's what I want you to take away from this. But the big thing, if you forget all of this, what's the consequence of hypernatremia? It'll create a hypertonic kind of solution of the blood, which yanks water out of the cells, cells shrink. Which cells are the most important? Brain cells. What can they develop? Osmotic demyelination syndrome. That's more common if they originally had hyponatremia, and you give them a ton of sodium and they shrink in the ponds, or it can rip the bridging veins and arteries and cause bleeds, which can cause a lot of neurological dysfunction. That's it. All right, my friends, now let's move on to how do we actually diagnose hyponatremia? In other words, 
patient comes in to the clinic, to the hospital with maybe no symptoms or some weird neurological dysfunction, I get a BMP, their serum sodium comes back super high. Why do they have the hypernatremia? Let's figure that out. Let's talk about it. All right guys, so now we're gonna talk about the diagnostic approach to hypernatremia. So you order some labs on a patient, maybe they develop neurological dysfunction, maybe it's just a part of your workup for whatever reason. The serum sodium comes back greater than 145. What is that? Hypernatremia. So your job is now to determine what in the heck is the reason they developed hypernatremia? Is it because of a renal water loss, an extra renal water loss, a sodium gain? I gotta figure this out. So how do I actually go about doing this? If there's a high serum sodium greater than one, 45 milliequivalents per liter. The first thing I wanted to determine is, is what I wanna know. Are the kidneys dumping water or are they actually reabsorbing water? That's really, when it comes to it, that's the crux of the discussion. So what I want to know is if I were to compare these two particular scenarios, I wanna know is the kidneys having very little water or are they having, are they putting lots of water into their urine? And that's automatically gonna tell me if it's a renal versus an extra renal water loss or like a sodium gain. So that's the first thing I can do. So how in the heck do I do that, my friends? Here's how I do it. The first thing I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna check something called the urine osmolality. So I'm gonna check the urine and see how much water is present in their urine because I can, I can actually extrapolate that off the osmolality. In other words, in this situation, if there's very little water, very little water, what would that be indicative of? What would be the osmolality? It'd be a very hypertonic solution. If it's a very hypertonic solution, then the urine osmolality will be very high. Yeah, you'll have a high urine osmolality. So urine osmolality will be on the higher end, right? And what do we say for that one? Just to give you that number there, it'd be generally a greater than 600 is the kind of concept here. And so this urine is containing, again, very little water. And so we use the term, it's a concentrated urine, yeah? So that's an important concept to take away from this. The second situation here is you have this patient and he's just, he's just dumping water into his actual urine. So there's his, there's his water loss right there. They're not losing water from the kidneys. These people are losing water from the kidneys. So their urine osmolality is going to contain lots of water. So the tonicity is going to be what? Very low. And so in this situation, you'll have a low urine osmolality. And oftentimes there's different numbers. We'll go through this in a little bit here in a second, but we say it's less, uh, sorry, in this situation, it is less than 600. So this one's greater than 600, this one's less than 600, but we'll actually kind of divvy this up a little bit more in a second. Now, with that concept, is this urine super diluted, meaning it contains lots of water diluting out all the solutes, or is it relatively concentrated? No, that thing's got tons of water. So they got a dilute urine, baby. So this is a dilute urine. And that's a very interesting concept because what that tells me is that's their source of water loss. So right away, I'm able to, for the most part, get myself started on this and say, okay, in this patient population who has the high sodium, I can already have differentiate whether it was a renal versus a extra renal loss. So in this particular situation, this is going to be a, what? A renal water loss. That's this one. And then I gotta figure out which one it is in a second here. Where this one, it could be due to two particular scenarios. One is the least common one out of these, which is the sodium gain and we'll talk about that in just a second, or it could be the extra renal water loss. I don't want us to get stuck down a rabbit hole of all these like extra tests. I think like really the most important test when it comes down to it is the urine osmolality, because I think it gives you kind of a really good way of being able to differentiate if it was a renal versus extra renal loss or sodium gain, and then use your history to really differentiate. But just for the sake of adding in some tests in case you see them, another thing that happens here is, if you're trying to figure out was it a sodium gain or was it an extra renal water loss, I mean seriously, history is key. Are they ventilated? Do they have fevers? Did they just get a third degree burn all over their body? Do they have um, any excessive amounts of uh, you know, diarrhea or vomiting? That's key. 
do where they have they been getting tons of sodium chloride solutions hypertonic saline have they been getting sodium bicarb do they have hyperaldosteronism that's kind of the things that you could do right but if you really wanted to sometimes what you can actually check on these patients is something called a urine sodium and what it tells me is whether or not the kidneys are kind of reabsorbing sodium right properly or if the patient's getting so much salt that the kidneys don't have the ability to maintain all of it and they dump that salt into the urine. And that's kind of an easy way to go about it. If a patient's so sodium overloaded, their kidneys aren't gonna be able to maintain that. They're gonna dump some of that sodium. And so what I could really do if I really wanted to is I could actually go a step further to figure out which one it is. And so what I could actually do is, is I could check something called the urine sodium. And in this particular situation, these people are volume depleted, right? They can reabsorb sodium all day if they needed to. So they're gonna have a heavy renin-angiotensin aldosterone system activity. So their urine sodium is very low. Whereas these patients are getting so much sodium chloride from solutions, or they're reabsorbing so much sodium across their kidneys because of aldosterone that their body is loaded with sodium. And so they're gonna to filter tons of sodium across their kidney tubules because they're either getting so much or they're reabsorbing so much. So their blood is filled with sodium that when it filters, the kidney tubules just can't keep up with that massive amount of sodium that a lot of it is lost into the urine. And so the urine sodium in this particular situation will be high and that's really it so then from here you can say sodium gain what's the particular etiologies it's those iv fluids or it's increase aldosterone and if i didn't know which one guess what i could do i could check the aldosterone level if it's extra renal water losses what would i think about gi losses such as ng tube suction vomiting diarrhea or insensible losses in other words, is the patient ventilated, breathing too fast, fevers, sweating, or burns? Then I come to renal water loss, which is a tiny bit more complicated. So now I come to the next situation here, which I'm like, okay, I don't know if it's the diuretics or if it's the, if it's the actual DI. How do I determine that? Well, it's very interesting. So remember I told you less than 600? I can actually kind of divvy this up here. I can actually divvy this up a little bit more. And I can say that if the urine osmolality is actually, yes, in this situation low, right? Or the urine osmolality is really low. So now the urine osmolality is really low. That actually can help me to a degree. And I'll explain that in just a second, I promise. But this is actually a relatively important concept because if the urine osmolality is between 300 to 600, that tells me something. And if it's less than 300, that really tells me something. That's a really important concept, because I just said it was less than 600. If it's less than 300, that really is helpful. I'll explain why. And if it's between 300 to 600, that can also be very helpful. So, if the urine osmolality is between 300 to 600, it's diuretics. Then it is diuretics, right? So this is going to be diuretics such as the mannitol, this is the urea, this is the hyperglycemia, or this is the loop diuretics, right? And then again, all of these were, what do we call these? These are osmotic diuretics, osmotic diuretics, right? Here's another concept. If the urine osmolality is super, super low, then it is DI. All right, let me explain this for a second, really particularly to the diuretics. Why is the urine osmolality not as low as this one? Well, here's the reason why. With diuretics, what do they do? Diuretics can actually cause you to lose volume, so they decrease your volume. When they decrease your volume, right, they actually do what? They can stimulate ADH production. ADH can then go to the kidneys and do what? Reabsorb water. And so if they reabsorb water, there might be just a little, they're gonna cause diuretics to do two things. I'm gonna explain in just a second here. But they're gonna reabsorb water, right? Some degree of water into the actual bloodstream, right? There's some degree of water that's gonna be reabsorbed because diuretics can actually cause volume depletion. And so your job would be to try to be able to do the best that you can to replace some of this. But diuretics also directly cause the kidneys to dump water into the urine. So they cause a dilute urine, but they also cause some degree of water reabsorption. 
So because of that, you still have ADH present, which can actually reabsorb water. That's why the urinosmolality is not as low as those problems because in this patient population with DI, they got no ADH or their kidneys aren't responding to the ADH. And so they don't reabsorb almost any water. And so they dump massive amounts of water and they just don't reabsorb any. That's the problem. In this situation with diuretics, they can, they actually have some degree of water reabsorption and that's why. There's one more thing though. You're like, Zach, okay, well how do I know if it's nephrogenic versus if it's actually some type of central? That's a great question. So now I go to the next step here. So now I gotta ask the question, is it nephrogenic or is it central? So here's what I do. I say, let me give the patient DDAVP. I'm gonna give this patient DDAVP. You know what DDAVP is? DDAVP is ADH. I want you to remember that. DDAVP is essentially ADH. They are the same thing. In a patient who has central DI, central diabetes insipidus, right? The problem is that they don't produce ADH. If you give them ADH, now you're just basically supplementing what they aren't producing. Then it's gonna actually work on the kidneys because the kidneys are responding in central DI. They'll reabsorb water. What will happen to the urine osmolality if they reabsorb water? It'll go up. So if in this particular situation, the urine osmolality goes up, that tells me that the actual problem is what? That tells me that the problem in this particular situation is central DI because that means that the patient isn't making ADH. And if I give them ADH, they'll reabsorb water and then there'll be less water in the urine. And this is, which one? Central DI. And then in the other situation, your DDAVP, you're giving them ADH. Their body's already producing ADH and nephrogenic diabetes and diabetes. They just don't care. They don't respond to it. So if you give them that and the urine osmolality stays low or it doesn't change, in other words, it doesn't change, it's still low, then what does that tell me? That tells me that it doesn't matter if you give them ADH because their kidneys are not going to respond to it. And what does that tell me? It's nephrogenic DI. It's nephro genic DI. And that's the concept of diagnosing a patient who has uh, a hypernatremia. So if we go through this, it may seem complicated, but it really, when you think about it in a, in a kind of a, a purposeful pathophysiological process, it should make sense. The last question that sometimes comes up is that there's this talk of volume status, right? So use lighting, utilizing volume status obviously is essential and adding to the diagnosis. So also you should understand that volume status comes into play to a small degree here. So add in volume status to your diagnosis as well. And there's many different ways to do that. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but look at a couple different things. And I'm just going to kind of walk you through this. So look at their jugular venous pressure. Look at their IVC. That's one thing. If it's flat and they have a low JVP, they're probably volume down. It's probably a renal water loss or an extra renal water loss. But if they're big and puffy, it's probably a sodium gain because these patients are likely more hypervolemic. That's important to remember. Sodium gain, usually hypervolemic patients. Look at other things besides that. Look at skin turgor. Look at skin turgor. Look at um, mucous membranes. So are they dry? Are they moist? If it's very dry, you have decreased skin turgor, it could be indicative of a hypovolemia. The next thing is, look at things like, um, you know, uh, edema. So is there any generalized edema? Is there any peripheral edema? Because if there is, it could be a hypervolemic cause, like a sodium gain. But if it's normal, it could be a, a, a water loss. It might not be super obvious. Look at other things like their BUN and their creatinine. If it's super, super high BUN and creatinine, it could be because they're losing water from their body and their volume depleted. So it could be a hypovolemia type of cause, a water loss problem. The other one is vital signs. So vital signs, are they having orthostatic kind of hypotension? Are they tachycardic hypotensive? It could be a volume loss. Are they having a high blood pressure? It could be a sodium gain. So utilize all of these tests to your advantage to come up with what's their volume status. But I don't think it's that important when it really comes to the diagnosis. It just may give a little bit of extra help on those exam questions. But I think the big thing is your hypervolemic patients if you will, are gonna be the sodium gain patients. And most of these other patient populations, like extra renal water losses, the renal water losses like diuretics are gonna be hypovolemic patients. And then your 
DI patients are usually a euvolemic patient population. So again, DI, usually euvolemic, diuretics, extra renal water losses, hypovolemic, sodium gain, usually hypervolemic. All right, my friends, let's now go on to talking about the treatment. All right, my friends, so now we're gonna talk about the treatment of hypernatremia. So this really comes down to the simple concept here. The most common cause is water losses, right? So just give them back water. That's it, I mean, it's really not that complicated, right? Give them back water. And so what I want you to know is, a lot of the times on the exam, they may have you calculate how much water you have to give back by determining something called the free water deficit. Okay, and so what may end up coming up in the question is that you have a patient who has hypernatremia. Here is their weight, here is their, um, you know, particularly if they're a male or a female, and then here is their current sodium level, calculate their free water deficit, how much fluid you're gonna give back to them in liters over a 24 hour period. And that's it. So let me quickly give you the formula. So I'm gonna kind of put here the free water deficit, which you're gonna give in the liters, right, is equal to, whatever the serum sodium is for the patient, so they're gonna give you that, minus 140, which is between 135 and 145, which is the normal serum sodium, divided by 140, multiplied by the total body water. And how do you calculate total body water? The way that we calculate total body water is this is actually gonna, so we'll add another formula here. So total body water is equal to, Generally, your weight in kilograms multiplied by some type of constant. And that constant depends on if you are a male or if you are a female. If you're a male, that constant is 0.6. If you're a female, it's 0.5. All right, so let's actually do an example here to make sense of this. So we got, you know, with this particular patient, let's say that we have a 70 kilogram female with a serum sodium of approximately 156. Your, the, the answer that you have to kind of be able to come up with is what is the free water deficit? It's a plug and chug kind of question, right? So then what you're gonna do is you're gonna say, okay, free water deficit. This is how many liters I'm gonna give to the patient over a 24 hour period. And then I'm gonna plug these things in. Their serum sodium is 156. I'm gonna subtract that from 140, divide that from 140, and multiply that by the total body of water for the patient, which is going to be 70 kilograms multiplied by what? 0 0.5, because they're a female. And then when you do all this, what would you get? Their free water deficit, if you plug all of this in, ends up being approximately about four liters. So that's how much water you have to give them over a 24 hour period to replace their free water deficit. And that's the concept, and this changes obviously in a daily situation. So you have to take into consideration all their intake and outputs, and then obviously continue to calculate this. But that's the overlying kind of theme, is that if a patient is hypernatremic, the reason why they're hypernatremic is likely because they have water losses, fix their water losses by giving them back water. How much? Determine their free water deficit. The second question that you have to say is, okay, if I have to give them back water, how do I give them back water? <laughs> this may sound like a dumb question, but there's different ways that you can give back water. One is perfect ad librium, just tell them to drink water. That'd be the perfect scenario, right? So one would just be, hey, drink some water. You're gonna get that down the GIT, that sucker's gonna move right into the actual bloodstream. And then from there, you're going to increase the amount of water in the bloodstream. That would be a preferable mechanism, right? Obviously, in a perfect world, I would love that. So the goal here is enteral water. Here is the problem. Sometimes patients who have hypernatremia may not be able to take PO water. If they can, that would be beautiful. But it's unlikely that they're gonna be able to do that because that's the problem, is usually the reason for hypernatremia is they have an inability to access free water. They can't do that. If they can, great. Oftentimes, you have to put in an NG tube or an OG tube and then run water down that right into their gullet, okay? That would be one way. So there's one way that I could give them back their free water deficit is I can push water down their gullet. If for some reason, I can't do that because they're MPO or I just can't give them water for whatever particular reason, then I can go IV. So then what I can do is, I can give them water and this solution here is gonna squirt water right into their bloodstream, increasing their actual water. And again, what will that do? That'll cause a relative decrease in their sodium, 
and that will do what? Fix their hypernatremia. So the question is, is what kind of IV solutions could I give the patient? So this would be then IV solutions, right? And you want this to contain water to some degree. In a perfect world, what would it be? One would be something called D5W. This is pretty much water with just a little bit of dextrose in it, okay, a little bit of sugar. If you can't do that, then you can give other solutions that are very hypotonic. They contain just a little bit of salt, unfortunately, but they have a good amount of water in them. And they may be other alternative options if you don't want to drop their sodium too quickly. And I'll mention that in just a second. But then you can do things like half normal saline. So it's half of whatever 0.9% would be, right? So this is 0.45% normal saline or a quarter normal saline. And these contain a good amount of water and just a tiny bit of salt in them. These would not be the most ideal. This would be the preferred, right? So this would be the preferred. These would be kind of the le lo lower down the list. And I'll explain why you would do that, but these are the two options. So I'm gonna try to fix the free water deficit, give them back water, either PO or NG, enteral water basically, or IV water. This is the preferred way. These would be the second kind of option. Now, here's the overarching thing. When you give patients back water, you're replacing their free water deficit, you gotta be careful. The reason why is when you try to give them back water, what would you do to the serum sodium? Theoretically, you could drop the serum sodium. One of the feared complications of giving them water is that you could drop the sodium too quickly. And if you drop the sodium too quickly, what would be the concern with that? Then, hypernatremia sucks water out of cells. Hyponatremia pushes water into cells. The feared complication would be something called cerebral edema. So how do we prevent that? We don't want this, right? This is bad news bears. How do I prevent that? The goal is to make sure that I don't go greater than 0.5 milli equivalents per liter over a uh, generally an hour period, okay? So if I decrease the sodium to prevent this from happening, how do I do that? I say I will not, I will not decrease it by greater than, so I will not decrease by greater than or equal to 0.5 milli equivalents per liter per hour. That's the, the goal. Now, if you think about it in an easier way, 24 hour period, right? 24, if you half that, what would that give you? 12. So another way that you could think about it is you could say no greater than, or you could say, you could say, or no greater than or equal to 12 milli equivalents per liter over a 24 hour period is another way of looking at it. But that's the th concept and I really, really need you guys to remember this. Please don't forget that, okay? So again, hypernatremia, you have to do what? Increase their water intake. How do you do that? Calculate the free water deficit, give them back water, whether it be enteral or IV. When you give them back water, just monitor their serum sodium because if you drop it too quickly, it could push water into the cells, cause cerebral edema. How do we prevent that? Don't let the sodium go greater than 0.5 milli equivalents per liter per hour or greater than 12 milli equivalents per liter over a 24 hour period and you should be okay. All right, the last concept here is we give them water, but while we're replacing their free water deficit and fixing their water losses, try to treat the cause that led to the water loss or the sodium gain. Let's talk about that. All right, my friends, so now what I gotta do is, is I'm giving them back free water. I'm replacing their free water deficit. As I replace their free water deficit, increase their actual water intake because they have a lot of water losses causing their hypernatremia, preventing overcorrection uh, over by dropping that sodium. Again, be careful, don't wanna cause cerebral edema, don't go greater than 0.5 milli equivalents per liter per hour or greater than 12 in a 24 hour period. Then I gotta, while I'm doing that, treat the underlying cause. So there's many different ways we could go about this. If they're vomiting, stop their treat, they're vomiting. If they're having diarrhea, fix their diarrhea. If they're on diuretics, stop their diuretics. If it's an osmotic diuretic, fix the, fix the cause. Get rid of it or fix their hyperglycemia. If it's due to a lot of sodium infusions, we'll talk about how we can fix that, but you treat the underlying cause. Some ones that I really wanna highlight of treating the underlying cause is these. First one is what about the problem with the patient who isn't producing ADH? Well, in that patient population, guess what I'm gonna do? For central DI, I'm gonna give them 
DDAVP. So DDAVP is also known as desmopressin. I'm gonna use that in treating the patient who has a problem with producing ADH called central DI. All right, that's the first thing. The second thing is what about the patient who maybe in this situation ADH is actually normal and ADH is coming and trying to work on the actual vasopressin 2 receptors and increase water reabsorption, but it's not responding to this. So the problem is, is they aren't responding to the ADH. This is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, right? For that patient population, I actually can do two options. One is thiazides. The mechanism behind this is still not understood, so I don't want to really kind of give you the theoretical reasons because that's a waste of time. Thiazides may be one option for nephrogenic DI. The other one that I want to add in that you could just remember quickly if you want to have the brain space is what's called amyloride. Amyloride is a potassium sparing diuretic that may help whenever the patient has lithium induced uh, diabetes insipidus. So you can add in the little caveat here that if you want to, amyloride, amyloride is good in lithium induced nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, which is one of the causes, one of the big ones I mentioned. So that's the big concept there, right? The other way is that what if the problem is due to the situation where, okay, the other problem here is that the patient is getting way too much hypertonic saline, or maybe they're getting too much sodium chloride, or maybe they're getting too much sodium bicarbonate. So in this patient population, who has this excessive sodium gain. So now their problem is you're getting tons and tons and tons of sodium. And maybe even to a small degree, when you give these solutions, you also give a little bit of water. So these patients become hypervolemic. So the problem with these patients is they start to have a very high volume status, right? And so with this patient population, the problem comes down to is they have lots of sodium and their water is there, but it's just not enough. They don't have enough water. So what I wanna do is, I want to get rid of some of the sodium, and I wanna give them water. And so what I can do is, is I can try to cause them to pee out some of the sodium and a little bit of the water, a little bit of the water. So that's one way, and how would I do that? Diuretics. So diuretics will help me to pee out specifically things like thiazide diuretics and to some degree loop diuretics, right? So diuretics, I'll specifically give these and they'll help to cause a lot of sodium and some degree of water loss, right? But it's really the sodium that I wanna get rid of. So thiazides would be pretty good here. But again, I wanna get rid of some of that sodium and some of the water. And the second thing I can do is when I use diuretics, so I give loops diuretics, thiazide diuretics, things like that to get rid of lots of this volume that they may have, I want to replace that and so what I can do is I can give them something like D5W via the IV, or I can give them again PO or NGOG water. But I wanna give them water because I want water to come across either the GIT via the enteral water or via the IV and increase their amount of water but continue to diurese them. And this is usually the combo that you like to give to these patients is diuretics plus D5W or enteral water. And the whole goal is, is that whenever they're hypervolemic, you get rid of volume with diuretics and you replace it with some of the actual hypotonic fluids because then you're going to help to be able to fix their hypernatremia. So again, with the patient who you're treating for hypernatremia, replace their free water losses. How do you do that? Calculate their free water deficit, give them water in the form of enteral or IV. If you do that, make sure you don't overcorrect them and drop their sodium more than 0.5 or greater than or equal to 0.5 milliequivalents per liter over a hour period or greater than 12 in a 24 hour period because it can develop cerebral edema. Second, keep treating the underlying cause while you replace their free water deficit. If it's due to central DI, desmopressin. If it's due to nephrogenic, thiazides or amyloride for lithium induced DI. And then if it's due to a hypervolemic case where the patient is getting lots of sodium chloride infusions. So this is usually due to heavy amounts of sodium chloride infusions, whether this be hypertonic, sodium bicarb, 0.9% sodium chloride. They're hypervolemic. They have lots of sodium and some degree of water, but just way more sodium than water. Diuretics to get rid of the sodium in the water, and then water in the form of D5W IV or enteral water to replace some of the actual water losses. Because my goal is to get rid of sodium right, and to increase the water. And the way that I can do that is diuretics in D5W or diuretics and PO water or enteral water.
My friends, we have covered hypernatremia. I hope it makes sense. I hope that you guys liked it. As always, until next time.